Hello, and welcome to another episode of Operation 8-Bit Nibbles and Bites. I'm your host, Tony Landy, and joining me behind the camera, as usual, we have Sparky making sarcastic comments. Typically in a tutorial video, the presenter walks you through the steps to get something done, and everything is seamless, and everything works just fine, and there's a lot of movie magic going on. What you rarely see are all of the mistakes and the problems that have to be solved to actually get things working. Our December video on Concurrent DOS 386 is a good example of this. In that episode, we glossed over the problems we had getting the installations disk pulled together so we could actually get an OS loaded onto the emulator. So as promised in that episode, we're doing this follow-up episode where we're going to pull back the curtains and show you some of the sausage making that we had to do to get all of that to work. Now, we're not just going to show you the problems we ran into. We're also going to show you how we got past each one of them. And in the process, we're going to show you a, full, a few tricks of the trade. Also, we have a special bonus for you regarding concurrent DOS at the end of this video. Stick with me and you'll see what I mean. Obviously, the first thing we needed for our concurrent DOS demo was a set of physical installation disks. It wasn't all that hard to find a few sites where we could download these, but all the copies we pulled down seemed to have the exact same issue. To start with, none of the IMG files were bootable. We could open them up and see the files are there, but they all seemed to be missing the master boot record. So after a lot more searching, we finally came across a set of disks on BitSavers that are supposed to be bootable. Unfortunately, they weren't in an image format that any of the disk management programs we tried could read. Luckily, my Google foo is strong. And after a bit more digging, I stumbled on this utility from Dave's old computers that could convert the IMD files to an IMG format. Getting this to work is supposed to be pretty simple. I've got a command prompt open, and from here, I'll give it the name of the file to convert, the name I want for the output file, and set the switch for binary output. And it's a 16-bit app, so it won't run on 64-bit Windows 10. Okay, how do we fix this? Easy. What I'm gonna do is fire up DOSBox because that runs an older OS that is 16-bit compatible. Next, I'll mount the working folder to the host PC as the C drive. I kept fat fingering the convert commands, so I decided to write a little batch program that would do all three files at once. I just dropped that file into the folder, ran it from the command line in DOSBox, and there we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if that worked. We'll pop back over to PCM, mount disk one to the A drive, and success! Okay, now since the plan was to do the demo on actual hardware, the next thing we need to do is get the images burned onto physical floppy disks. And if you haven't guessed, we ran into another stag. The problem is that these disks are 720K, and the USB floppy drive that I have doesn't support that size. Now, there is a simple trick that you can use to convert high density floppies to 720K. All you need to do is take a piece of tape and cover the hole on this side. This trick actually comes in handy if you have an older computer that can only support double density disks and all you have are high density floppies. Just for grins and giggles, I popped one of these into my drive and gave it a shot. But as I expected, it was more of a hardware limit than a media problem. To get this fixed, we're gonna head back over to PCM and restart the VM using the bootable 720K image. While that's booting up, from the disk item menu on the menu bar, I'll select the option to create a blank 1.4 megabyte disk image that we're gonna name disk zero. Next, 
we'll mount that to the B drive and hit escape to get out of the setup menu and into a DOS prompt. So you see where I'm going with this, right? Since I booted into concurrent DOS, all I need to do now is format the floppy image with the slash S switch and I'm getting a f***ing out of memory error. I configured this thing with two megs of memory. What the f*** are we getting a not enough memory error for? Getting this problem figured out was a little trickier than the others. But after a bit more digging, I found out what was going on. If we head over to the concurrent DOS installation guide, it explains that when CDOS loads, it looks for a start batch file that contains the environment commands that allow you to configure each of the individual sessions. It also points out that if these files don't exist, it'll just default to loading whatever is in the autoexec.bat. So if we look at the start 001 bat file, you can see that one of the commands in this session is to limit the memory size of that session to 256K. To get around this, I renamed the start 001 bat file and then activated the autoexec.bat. And after rebooting with the new config, the format worked and we got a bootable image disk. With the disk formatted, we can just copy the files from drive A over to the new disk, back over on WinImage. I've loaded the new 1.4 megabyte copy of my boot disk. And we're finally able to get this to burn to a physical disk. Now that we have a set of physical installation disks, the last step is to get concurrent DOS loaded onto the desktop that we bought just for this project. With disk one in the floppy drive, we'll power on the PC, and it froze up. Yeah, it's worked. <laughs> Sparky and I tried a lot of different things to get that to work. But no matter what we did, we just couldn't get concurrent DOS to start up on that machine. Or any other machine in the house for that matter. With time running out, it was at this point that we made the decision to just go with the emulator for our December video. We were able to get a later version of the OS called multi-user DOS to load on this little HP Mini. But the disk we used to get this working didn't work on the Dell either. Given that this is a pretty obscure operating system, there wasn't anything we could find online that would help. But as near as we can figure, it's a compatibility issue with the hardware. Best that we came to is that there's some obscure command that CDOS is trying to execute when it starts up that's just causing some newer computers to choke up and die. A lot of times when you're working on an older technology, especially something as obscure as this operating system, you can't just Google the answer to a problem. And even when you can find the answer, there's usually some level of trial and error troubleshooting that goes into making everything work. But in my honest opinion, this is what makes playing with some of this older tech so much fun. You try to figure out how to do something and then you go, and then you get to go share it with the community. To that point, if you think about it, not everything we just showed you in this episode was a total waste of time. If you go back and watch all the steps, we showed you how to make a bootable 1.4 megabyte disk from a 720K image. We demonstrated how to convert IMD files to IMG images using an old 16-bit application. <laughs> there was even a quick hack on how to make your high-density floppies work with low-density drives. So fine. We didn't get concurrent DOS to load bare metal on this modern computer like we had originally wanted to. And we had to do the episode using an emulator. Am I upset? Not in the least. 
I like how that episode came out, and I'm really, really honored to be part of the official December 2020 playlist. And not for nothing, this is where being part of the retro tech community comes into play. We reached out to our friend, Retro Tech Chris, and I sent him a set of our installed discs. Chris has a bunch of old IBM PCs from the early 90s, and after bits of futzing around, he figured out what the issue was, and he got concurrent DOS running on real hardware. He even has a terminal connected to show off what set CDOS apart from other MS-DOS multitasking add-ons that were available at the same time. So I'm linking that video below and adding this title card so you can head over to his channel and see all of this in action. If he lets me, I might even make a brief cameo because we've done something that is, was unimaginable back in the 1990s. Anyway, oh man. <clears throat> Anyway, we hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please make sure to hit that thumbs up button. Also, don't forget to subscribe because we have a lot of cool stuff in the works.